demokrasia imeondokea katika dirisha if he had not died i believe ford would have eventually stuck together there is a, a trip which has been planned you come before i travel i don't think it was a trip that was properly arranged on a chilly Friday morning of 14th August 1992, veteran politician Masinde Muliro died at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. He kept on saying, Muliro, well, you know, trying to resuscitate him, and he didn't. It's a very difficult situation. There were accusations that uh, my mother and I had been involved in uh, his passing somehow. His death raised many questions and sent political shockwaves across the country. All the rulers, I think, wherever they were in this world, who are concerned. 29 years later, we revisit his last moments. My name is Duncan Haemba. This is KTN News. On Monday, 10th August 1992, veteran politician, a first and second liberation hero, Henry Pius Masinde Muliro, abruptly left the country for an impromptu meeting in England, organized by a diaspora group that was supporting newly formed opposition party in Kenya, Ford, that had all the second liberation icons, among them Jaramogi Odinga, Kenneth Matiba, Charles Rubia, and Martin Shikuku, backed by Young Tax, the Church, Law Society of Kenya, and civil societies. Mzee um, Mlero had declared he wants to be president. We launched it in an uh, intercontinental hotel uh, that he wants to be president. But he was in the middle. He was neither pro Odinga nor pro Matiba. He wanted it to, to be together. In fact, I think at one time a journalist asked him, are you pro Odinga or pro Matiba? And he said, why can't you ask me whether I'm pro Kenya? However, cracks had already begun within Ford, few months after its formation as the big shots jostled for the presidential ticket. And it was on the verge of disintegration when the London meeting was organized by Ford UK chapter, whose chairman was Joseph Guitari, and only Muliro was invited in a bid to rescue the ship from sinking. <laughs> Musikari Nazi Kombo, Muliro's aide at the time, was the only person who accompanied him to London. We had people in the UK, uh, some of them uh, Kenyans, uh, who were saying we should broker a very strong you, you know, a unit program so that Ford does not split. split. And the meeting was on and off, on and off, on and off. And then one day, Mzee uh, calls and says, now we must, uh, we must go to England. <laughs> so I put down everything else. And uh, we went to England. We went to England. Um, the, if the, this young, this, this lawyer called Wajakoya, yeah, he was really the one organizing most of those things. So we, we had various meetings. Jotham Nyukuri, who was Muliro's personal assistant, and the late Michael Wamalwa were in Northrift, campaigning for Masinde Muliro to win the Ford chairmanship and become the opposition's presidential candidate. He says... They were not aware of the London meeting, a position Muliro's eldest son, Mukasa Mwambu, admits. So we were campaigning. I left with the Wamalwa. We were supposed to cover Nandi, was an issue, and the Turkana. 
we had no idea about, about this trip. We covered the Wasinigishu, we covered Nandi. We went and slept in Kitale, ready to go to, to Turukana. What I know is that even on that very day, uh, he was not sure whether he would travel or not. And uh, I don't know what arrangements had been arranged, uh, had been made in England. And, uh, but there were very uh, many telephone calls at that time urging him to travel. And I think that even up to a few hours before the flight, uh, he had not been prepared to travel. He almost traveled alone, uh, but then I think uh, um, Honorable Combo, uh, I think he, he asked him or he urged him to, to travel with him. Um, so I don't think it was a trip that was properly arranged. Nyukuri and Wamalwa were in Kitale town preparing to leave for Turukana when they were ordered back to the base, Nairobi. London was calling. In the morning, I had a telephone in my house. Murilo called me. He said, Mumefika wapi? He said, we have finished the, with the rest of this place. We are now going to Turukana tomorrow morning. He said, don't come back here. There is a, a trip which has been planned. You come before I travel. So when I went to the hotel to pick your Marua to, your Marua was ready thinking we are going to Turukana, isn't it? I said, we are not going to Turukana, we are going back to Nairobi. He said, why? I told him, Mse says he is traveling. He said, why? Because this meeting is just coming, we must cover. Other areas, isn't it? But we drove. We got here around four to the office and we, we said, you can't travel. You will travel after that meeting. And he accepted. He said, what is it? He said, there is a group of people, I don't know, businessmen, he was supposed to address and, uh, but we said no. So I drove him to his house, uh, to, to the house. Uh, then around seven, he called me. He said, these people are insisting that if I go tonight, I get there in the morning, I dress them, then I can come back in the evening. Watch at the end, to the end a combo. I didn't see him again, you know that. <laughs> Masinde Muliro's final flight was on the night of 13th August 1992, which touched down at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport on Friday morning, 14th August. Muliro died while on the queue to the immigration desk. When we came back, everything was all right. It was perfect until we reached the airport here. He had given me his passport so that I can, you know, do the, as a spanner boy, do the needful. And then, uh, but he was behind me. And all of a sudden, I just saw him going down, down. And he never came out. Never came out. I've never understood what happened, but it has never come out. You know, stories have been told about uh, the what. And for me, I can talk about them freely. Uh, when we were going, all of a sudden, the water was there. Uh, and they chatted in the usual style. They were saying, hey, you have come to check whether I'm going out, running away or, <laughs> you know, that kind of talk. So we, he also traveled on that same plane. But where he went, uh, I, I cannot tell you, uh, because I don't know. In London, we parted, we went our way, he went his way. When we came back, again, he was there. Eh? 
And in film said, laughed and said, eh? he has come to check to see whether I'm back. <laughs> For Kombo, whose meaning in Kiswahili means going wrong, everything had gone wrong for him that fateful Friday. I panicked. I panicked asking for if there's any help, doctor. And there was a white man who came there uh, and says he was a doctor, a passenger. Uh, I'm a doctor. What is his name? So I told him, uh, Mliro. So he kept on saying, Mliro, well, you know, trying to resuscitate him. And he didn't. It's a very difficult situation. I just panicked. But it's on the plane, he ate well, he did everything. There was nothing until we re until there at, on the immigration line. Yeah, there's nothing. The man who was coming home to mend broken ties in Ford died in his hands as a helpless combo desperately watched in utter shock. We uh, had not reached the immigration. We were in the queue. So when, and he is behind me, so obviously when uh, somebody falls, uh, a commotion, uh, you, yeah, you turn and every, uh, every, people in the line, everybody say there's a commotion. Yeah. But uh, as he, he, by the time he reached home, I had, had down, uh, I had turned and I was holding him. So you, he was going down in my hands. Yes. So he literally died in your hands. Yes. Yes. We had gone to the airport with my mother to collect him. And uh, that is when we, we, we learned that he, uh, he had passed at the airport. Nothing spectacular. Yeah, up to the time we get, we got off the plane, nothing spectacular. We got off just the normal way. He was not being supported or, or, or for me to support him to walk. No. He was just normal. Everything was normal until on that line. I think they, they disembarked and um, in my mind, uh, because he usually traveled very light, and I expected him to be among the first people off the, 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 the plane. And, uh, but he, he didn't come. And uh, time passed, I don't remember exactly what time, but he had traveled with Honorable Kombo, and I'd gone to the airport to pick him with my mother. And uh, Honorable Kombo came and told my mother that uh, he, had passed, he had passed on, he had collapsed. Mwambo Muliro was 39 years old when his father died. Says the sad, cold news crippled them. And with the time, and nearly 30 years later, it is a challenge reconstructing the events. No, we, we, we didn't go to where he was. Um, uh, I think that's normally a restricted area. We, I don't think, no, I don't think we went there. I don't know whether my mother went there. But I don't remember, actually. I don't remember. But I don't think we, we went there. Uh, after we were told, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Events that followed after Muliro's demise preceding his burial were as dramatic as they came. There were accusations that uh, my mother and I had been involved in uh, his passing somehow. Uh, there were accusations of that nature. So I think that actually took up a lot of our time. Those, those, that back and forth, we were being accused of uh, complicity in his passing. Muliro's widow, now deceased, Marcia Nomalungelo, was the one on the receiving end. It's very hard um, because if you think uh, my mother stays in Kitale and uh, we just happened to go to, Na uh, to Nairobi with her on that Monday only because I was going to come back on the Friday. Yeah? So she would not have been in Nairobi at that time. Uh, 
I was asked to pick him up on the Friday. I think I got a call, I, don't, I forget from whom, uh, to go to pick him up from the airport on the Friday. Yeah. So what happened between the Monday when he left and the Friday when he came back, we had no part of. Yeah. And our job was just to pick him up on the, on the, on the Friday. And, I, um, and it's, it's, it's fortuitous, I think, that I went with my mother. Yeah, because ordinarily I might have gone by myself and then taken him home and I would have gone to work because I was working on that day. Um, and then for people to come and uh, accuse you of uh, having some role in um, foul play, uh, it's, it is a bit disappointing. On one hand, on the other hand, politics being what it is, I think uh, it's very possible that somebody had a, a, a reason to try to um, uh, point fingers in a, in a wrong direction. Also under fire was Muliro's personal physician, Professor Arthur Obel. We were surprised most because the, the, the doctor came already knowing what had caused the death of Muse. He said it is heart failure. Before he reached the patient, he had a, a death certificate, which he was uh, already uh, saying the, the, the cause of the death. That surprised us, of course. I, I was not aware that he went to the airport with a death certificate. I was not. So it's very hard for me to, to, to comment. Yeah? In retrospect, if, if that had happened, it would, be, it would have been strange. Yeah? Because at the very least, he ought to have seen his patient and then uh, uh, drawn his conclusion after having seen the patient. Uh, so if he went to the airport with a death certificate, um, I don't know that. Yeah. The medical regulatory board summoned Professor Obel to answer to charges of violating the profession's ethical code, having signed the death certificate indicating Muliro had suffered cardiac arrest, yet no autopsy was conducted to establish the cause of death. He is reported to have protested, stating he would not have agreed to be a sacrificial lamb on a political platform. When contacted on 28th June to grant an interview, Professor Arthur Obel had agreed and given an appointment in two days' time, before he changed his mind the following day on 29th by stating, and I quote, May I retract what I said last evening? The wrath I received from most of the Bukusu people should just remain in the past. My remaining years of life should be characterized by peace and not creating needless wars. End of quote. The mystery behind Muliro's death deepened further as more dramatic events unfolded at the Lithinro Parlor. A quest by opposition movement to unravel the cause of his death were shattered by Muliro's family. Push for an autopsy turned into a nightmare for the opposition. I've never seen the cooperation of people. Everybody was concerned. All the lawyers, I think, wherever they were in this world, were concerned. And they said they were arranging the best pathologists to come to conduct the, the post-mortem to find out really the cause. So when we went, we said, we told the Lee people we are organizing post-mortem. The following day, we went, we wanted to see the body, and the Lee himself, the Mzungu, said, just wait, we are working on the body. You wait, you will see the body when we are through. What were they doing? We didn't know. We waited, we waited. 
And he came and said, now the body is ready. You can see the body. Kumbe, they were embalming the body. So he said, why? Why do you embalm the body? And we, we wanted to do the postmortem. He said, the family, the wife and his son, came and asked us to embalm the body. We asked him, Mama, why? She just told us that she does not want the body of her husband to be cut. I always say, if we had done a post-mortem, maybe it would have told us. But the family said no post-mortem. So we, he was buried with whatever happened to him intact with him and so that's why I don't know nobody ever knew but for me I would have preferred him post mortem but uh, the family said they didn't want him to be chopped cut cut you know because it feel very bad for when you cut somebody who is dead and yeah and that's how they felt. People wanted to carry out a post mortem but then I think as a family we did not see the need. Um, I think uh, a few years before, about three years before, I'm, I'm trying to fill a gap where maybe there's no gap. Yeah? A few years before, about three years or so, no, maybe five years before, uh, my brother passed, my youngest brother. And uh, my mother witnessed the autopsy. Yeah? And we never discussed it with her. But I suspect that that particular experience, she probably did not want her husband to go through. I've not been to an autopsy, but I think it's uh, quite a harrowing experience for those, who, for those of us who don't know what happens. I suspect that that might have been one reason why she felt there was no need. Um, in another way, uh, he had passed. The political temperatures were quite, quite high. There was uh, a lot of polarization. And it would have been very easy for uh, what would have been a very simple exercise to take on a life of its own. You know, so I think even in retrospect, I think it is, it's, it's a good thing that uh, we didn't carry out that autopsy. That Masinde Muliro had collapsed and died at the airport in itself was a police case that ideally would have attracted an autopsy on his body. Nonetheless, that was not the case. His family objected. Mama Masia was also a, quite a strong pers personality. And if she made up her mind, Everybody said we shall respect what Mama has said. It was bad. People were annoyed. Believe me, people didn't want to look at Mwambu. People didn't want to look at Mama. And uh, I think the effect reached, it was reaching also now, Ober. <laughs> you understand? In fact, that thing reduced the image of Mwambu completely from, from the people, even at home in the village. When the people said they, were, they, they could not do the post-mortem because Mwambu and his mother had blocked it. In life, the veteran politician, freedom fighter and champion for multi-party politics was a political giant who, among others, had straddled Kenya's political arena like a colossal dinosaur. In death, he lies next to this giant indigenous podo tree that he found already planted when he occupied the land in Sibanga Cherangani in 1966. The humongous tree still stands, perhaps symbolic to the multi-party democracy in Kenya that he agitated for along his second liberation comrades. Combo still remembers his last moments and last wishes. Jolly and looking forward to making sure this thing, because Ford was in his blood, yeah? 
and uh, he was very competitive, saying not everybody will have to toe the line, and and that's that's really how he was anxious. We better get back quickly, so that we can sort out this thing once and for all. But with a lot of determination, if he had not died, I believe Ford would have eventually stuck together because that was his mission absolutely he said without one ford moi will me will make the mince meet and that's what he was even as we were in london he was saying we, we as soon as we get back we must bring these people together we must bring these people together Muliro did not get a chance to meet and reconcile his close friends Jaramogi and Matiba. His death was Ford's death as well. It split into Ford Kenya and Ford Asili. Duncan Haemba for KTN News.